Amitav Chaudhary. I'm a member of the faculty here and the co-convener of the Global History Initiative at Queen's. And on behalf of the initiative, I want to welcome all of you, and especially those of you who have come from abroad and from other universities. Let me start by thanking and, in fact, congratulating uh, Hina Mistry and Elise Bell for putting together this conference. And um, I have to say, with very little help from me, but uh, abundant help from the department and the School of Graduate Studies, the Barnes Nugent Fund, and the Principal's Office. Now, my task uh, this morning is to introduce uh, Professor Heather Street Salter, who is the keynote speaker for this event. And also, this is the last event of our seminar series this year. So I am grateful to Jeff McNairn for making this possible to march the two events. And that has made it logistically so much easier. So Professor Street Salter is a professor of history and director of world history programs at Northeastern University. And she's also currently the chair of the department there. And before arriving at Northeastern, she was a professor at Washington State University uh, from 1999 to 2011, I believe, where she also was the director of world history programs. She's a historian of empire, imperialism, and world history, and is most well known for her 2004 book, Martial Races, the Military Race and Masculinity in British Imperial Culture, 1857 to 1914. And it is one of the most important elaboration on the ideology of martial races, and uh, perhaps one of the most important contributions to the history of masculinity in the British Empire to date. And I, I have to mention this when we've been talking about this since yesterday. I, I was a student at Washington State, and Heather was one of my professors. And when the book came out in 2004, I had just started at Washington State, and one of my graduate student colleagues, Marianne, baked a cake. Uh, with the cover of the book on it, on the surface of the cake. So we literally consumed the book. <laughs> was published. Uh, more recently, Professor Street Salter has published a book in 2017 from Cambridge University Press, World War I in Southeast Asia. And the book really rewrites the history of Southeast Asia and its involvement in the history of the First World War by looking at the expatriate Indians, captives of the First World War. Uh, also trying to connect the global connectivity of the British Empire. Um, he, she has also written a number of other books, co-authored uh, one with Trevor Getz, the book on empires and colonies in the modern world, and a few other textbooks and edited collections as well. Uh, Professor Street Salter is the recipient of numerous awards and scholarships and fellowships, and most recently, uh, the American Council of Learned Societies Fellowship which I understand, along with other things, will allow her to write for the next three years and, and not do much of teaching, thankfully. And um, I should also mention, having been a student of Heather's, that um, apart from her scholarship and her role as a major facilitator of world history and its emergence um, in, in, in the United States, she's also a phenomenal teacher. And whatever I've learned about teaching, I have to say I've learned from Heather. Uh, during my stay at uh, Washington State, she has supervised close to a dozen students, uh, PhD students and numerous masters. She served as my co-chair, and in, in Northeastern, I think, by now, she has supervised eight students, my last count. Um, so thank you, and Brad, I should also say that six years ago, we tried to invite Heather um, and she did come, but not all the way to Queens, because it was a snowy, snowy day. And Heather took a flight from Boston to Toronto, and the flight from Toronto to Kingston was cancelled. And she called me and called our department chair. And I understood her to be saying that the flight from Boston got cancelled. So I said, well, there's nothing else you can do, so sorry, it's cancelled. She was actually in Toronto and she took a flight back the same day and went back to Boston. So it took us six years to invite her back, but I'm very glad that you are here. Uh, please uh, welcome Professor Heather Street Salt. Thank you, Amitabh. I made it. 
So, and we chose March for a reason because we thought that would be a little bit better than, than February. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you especially to Amita for inviting me, and also thank you to Hina and Elise for um, organizing this this conference. Um, I'm really really excited to be here, and also to the grad students who are going to be presenting um, and for your really excellent work. So, as you can see from my title, oh, I didn't turn this on. I should do that. Now? Yes. Okay. It's not, I'm not going to be screaming. Okay. Um, so, you can see from my title that it is a very lofty title, and because of that, it's completely unmanageable and impossible to really talk about. I could, there's no way that I could possibly talk about all of the wide variety of anti colonial movements and the colonial response to them in East and Southeast Asia, even just in the 1930s. Um, there was really a huge amount going on in, in, uh, across both of these regions, and I couldn't possibly capture more than a fraction of it. So, like most historians, um, uh, I'm going to pare it down while still gesturing toward a much bigger picture. Um, and this has the, the advantage of keeping my talk manageable and also of telling what I think is a really good story. Um, so while the larger story that I'm going to be talking about has a lot to do with both East and Southeast Asia, most of the action that I'll be talking about took place in Shanghai in the early 1930s. Um, and, it's, and while it's related to a variety of anti-colonial movements in East and Southeast Asia, I'm really going to be focusing on the activities of the Soviet and Chinese Communist parties in the context of one momentous event that um, that occurred in 1931, or started in 1931, and which collectively became known as the Numon Affair. Um, so there's a, a variety of different reasons why I think the Numon Affair is important and that I'll touch on today, but for the purposes of this conference, one of the key things is the way that it sheds light on the very close and even integral relationship between colonialism and violence. Um, as most of us know who study colonialism, colonialism was by its very nature a violent enterprise, including, of course, physical violence and its threat, um, incarceration and policing of colonized people, especially dissidents, um, epistemological violence, like Elise was talking about in her paper a little bit ago, and also structural violence. Um, in the case of the New Law Affair, we can see all of these, actually, the, I can see all of these elements, what we're specifically going to see today are is physical violence and its threat, um, especially with incarceration um, and actual physical violence, used both as a weapon by, of colonial authorities and also of the anti-colonial um, activists themselves. So we'll see violence in, in both ways. Why was violence so central to the events um, and actors in the New Law Affair? I think this partially has to do just with the nature of colonialism itself, which is always profoundly concerned with security, um, rooting out dissidents, and preempting threats to the state. But it's also partly due to the particular nature of what was going on in Shanghai during the interwar period, um, especially in terms of the convergence and interest between the powerful international community in Shanghai and the ruling nationalist Guomindong Party, and also the revolutionary tactics of the Comintern, the Communist International, and the Chinese Communist Party there. So there's a whole lot going on just in Shanghai itself, in addition to the violent nature of colonialism um, it, more generally. So the stakes in terms of this affair were incredibly high. Everyone, both sides, believed that they were fighting for the future of their state or their territory or the right to colonize. Um, both sides believed that the other side was a dire threat to a viable future. And both sides believed that the ends justified the means, including uh, incarceration, torture, and murder. Okay, so what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about what the new law affair actually was, um, during which I think you'll see a clear connection to colonial and anti-colonial violence. And then I'm going to talk briefly about what the story reveals, in my opinion, about imperialism and colonialism more generally, 
um, and about an international communism um, and anti-communism in the interwar period more specifically. And I should say too that this is the first time um, I've, uh, I came across this um, story, I don't know, I think it was in 2013 when I found it in the archives accidentally. And I've known that I've, this needed to be a book. I needed to first finish my first book that came before this, or my second book that came before this. Um, and I've been chair. This is the first time that I've really had a chance to get back to this story. So um, I'm super excited. I'm also really excited to hear any of uh, you know ways that you can push me to think about this project because this is what I'll be working on for the next few years. Okay. So the new law affair. This is the fun part. Um, so on the first of June in 1931, a Frenchman named Joseph Ducou, who went by the alias uh, Serge Lefranc, and two, <laughs> yes, and aliases are all over everything. Everybody had multiple aliases in this. Um, he was arrested along with two members of the Malayan Communist Party, um, and he was arrested by British authorities in Singapore. Um, basically, I mean, this guy, we'll, we'll talk about him in a second, he, he was a, a known communist, a, a, a long time common turn operative, but he was super obvious in Singapore. He was like not making any secret about who he was meeting and, and the authorities were clearly tracking him from the beginning. So they always were talking about how strange it was, about how obvious he was being with his connections. Um, Ducru had actually arrived in Singapore on April 27th with a Chinese man called Tio Wen Fu, whose name, whose alias was Basa. And he passed himself off um, as uh, a Javanese person. He was actually Chinese. So on June 22nd, Ducru was convicted after being arrested of assisting, this is a quote, assisting in the management of an unlawful society, which was the Malayan Communist Party. He was sentenced to 18 months imprisonment, and then later he was sent to uh, French Indochina, where he was quickly arrested by the authorities because they had been looking for him for a while. Um, so Duclou and Bassa, and this is Bassa here, and he also had another alias called Sumito. He's actually a fairly well-known uh, commentator and operative in this period. Um, so Duclou and Bassa had been sent to Singapore as commenter representatives with the object of overseeing the reorganization and revitalization of the communist movement in Southeast Asia. Duclou, like I said, had been a well-known operative since 1923, and by the time of his arrest in 1931, he had worked with the Indian uh, communist Amin Roy to smuggle communist literature into India, and he had also served as the uh, secretary to the president of the Pan Pacific Trade Union in uh, Shanghai. Um, right before arriving, in, or recently before arriving in uh, Singapore, he had been in Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Saigon, where he had made contact with both local and international communist agents. Um, Bassa had also been the subject of British inquiries uh, to the Dutch a couple years earlier. They said, do you know this guy? We think he might be up to something. Um, but it was only with this incident that he was firmly connected to the Communist uh, Party. So all of this is to say that what was really significant about Duclos' arrest in Singapore was that he was carrying an address book on him when he was arrested, which again was the most incredible blunder given what his address book had in it. Okay, so some of the addresses, one of the addresses led colonial authorities to Duclos contact in Hong Kong, and that contact was when I Kwok, Ho Chi Minh. Okay, so Ho Chi Minh was um, one of the liaisons in Hong Kong for this, this whole uh, network that I'm going to talk about in a minute. So he was tracked down on June 6th by the British police in Hong Kong um, and then turned over to the Sovete General. So there's, there's uh, Ho Chi Minh. Um, and like I said, at the time he was serving as a liaison between the Comintern's Far Eastern Bureau in Shanghai, which we'll hear more about in a second, and all of the rest of the colonies in Southeast Asia. He was already well known to the French and thus he was considered a very valuable catch. But that's not all. Even more significant 
Duclos address book contained a telegraphic address for this called Hilano. And that address was located in Shanghai. So the Singapore authorities communicated that address to the British-led Shanghai Municipal Police Special Branch. These are the people that work on the top secret types of stuff. Um, and working in connection with the French Concession Police and the Nationalist Guomindong uh, Special Branch Police, they tracked down a guy named Hilaire Noulon, at least in the papers he was named, and he lived on, or the, the apartment that it came from um, was 235 Szechuan Road, and they went to his apartment on Szechuan Road and arrested him there on June 15th. So all of this is happening pretty quickly after Duclou is arrested. There wasn't a whole bunch at the Szechuan Road apartment, but they did find a key to another apartment there. Um, and so they, they tracked down this other apartment and that had a <coughs> jackpot. There were basically three steel boxes containing hundreds of reports and correspondence and handwritten letters and financial records of the Far Eastern Bureau of the Comintern and all of its connections to China, Japan and its dependencies, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaya, um, uh, and Indochina. Further investigation after all this was found brought to light five separate physical addresses connected to the Far Eastern Bureau, Bureau as well as eight post office boxes, four telegraphic addresses, and bank accounts at seven different locations. Um, New Long, again, an alias. Noulon and his wife, who was arrested uh, several days later, each had several different passports and aliases, and in fact, their real identity, identities were only brought to light in the 1990s. So they, they never found out at this time who they really were. Um, catastrophically, for the Far Eastern Bureau in Shanghai, the confiscated papers contained all of the pseudonyms and handwriting samples for decoding them of the many individuals that it employed in and around East and Southeast Asia, payroll documents indicating agents who were working in the Chinese national government and the British Municipal Police <laughs> and the Sûreté Générale. Um, and so, and also the key to decoding enciphered documents, which they had not been able to de de decipher. So it just, I mean, it had it all. It was everything that they could possibly have wanted um, in this particular arrest. So following the discovery of the new law files, um, oh, that's what I've been talking about. Following the discovery of these files, the British authorities made 95 further raids on communist bases in Shanghai. They arrested 276 alleged communists. They confiscated 815 different kinds of communist literature, yielding a total of 963,601 copies. Okay, so they just found a ton of stuff with this arrest. Once the police forces of the European colonial powers and the national government um, the Guomindong government began to piece together all the evidence uncovered in the Nulong case. It became clear that the Far Eastern Bureau was an important node in an organized, complex, and active network that spanned an enormous area in East and Southeast Asia. The, they figured out that the FEB communicated with Moscow via Berlin, um, while it also communicated with various points in Southeast Asia via Hong Kong, by, by the, the Ho Chi Minh connection. Um, the whole network was alive with connections established by regular mail, telegrams, and individuals who were moving from one location to another with, with a lot of rapidity. There were clear plans in the works to increase the intensity of all of these connections and to support anti-colonial movements wherever they existed in the region. So um, while the destroying this network didn't 
um, end the common turn activity and Communist Party in, in, activity in East and Southeast Asia, it inflicted an enormous wound that would not really heal until after World War II. So, um, it's not really a stretch. This is them. This is um, Hilaire and Madame Moulin, who those are their real names, and I'll talk about that a, a little bit at the end. Yakov Rudnik and Tatiana Moisenko. Um, but it's not a stretch to say that this was a really big deal at the time. Not just for the British and French and nationalist authorities, um, communism was illegal in China at this time. Um, but it was a big deal on an international stage as well. So the arrests and the subsequent trial of Nu Long in a Chinese court were reported in newspapers all over the world, including in China itself, but also in France, Britain, Singapore, Java, the United States, just to name a few. It's all, I mean, people knew about what was, was happening. Um, let me see here, there's one of the uh, articles in English. Um, communist and left-leaning organizations and individuals around the world, led by Willy Munzenberg, uh, the famous German communist, um, launched an international campaign to get the new law um, released, to get the new law couple released. They had been sentenced to death, <coughs> commuted, but they were stuck in a Chinese prison. Um, the reason that they were tried in a Chinese prison or a, the, a, tried in a Chinese court is because no European government would accept them as their, they, they claim to be Swiss, they claim to be Belgian, all the governments kept saying, nope, nope, not ours, and so they were tried in a Chinese court. Um, Munzenberg and the League Against Imperialism, which he helped to lead, portrayed the new law as legitimate workers who were framed for their legal but leftist work in the Pan-Pacific Trade Union Secretariat. Um, and people like Albert Einstein, Madame Sun Yat-sen, Clara Zetkin, and Aubrey Barbus lent their considerable authority to petitions demanding their release from Chinese prison and for trial in European courts. Okay, so um, also, another aspect of this story is that Madame Moulin um, was pregnant when she was put into prison, and she ended up having a baby in prison, and that baby was cared for by Madame Sun Yat-sen. And it's only that baby who later, in the 1990s, when he was in his 60s, um, revealed his parents' real names. So, okay. Um, so it's kind of an interesting story, right? I mean, <laughs> and when I found this by accident, I was like, oh my god, I just, how many books have been written on this? So I you know, started searching, started searching. Um, but not much has ever been written on it at all. Um, it's not that nobody knows about it, because most of the stuff that deals with Shanghai in this period actually mentions the New Long Affair. Um, so it's not like nobody knows about it, but um, they're just mentioned. So there's three articles um, on this, two by the same guy written in the 90s, and one by me. Um, and that is it. There's a few things. I've had some people search uh, in Chinese language. There's a few things written in Chinese. And right now, now that I'm getting ready to go back into work on this, I'm trying to figure out what's been written in Russian. There is uh, an article in German that I, would be able, that I will be able to read. Uh, but it doesn't have, it doesn't cite sources, which is not helpful. Um, but, <laughs> but it does, the person, the person did have contact with the commentary and sources, and so um, I, I think it's worth a read. Um, so anyway, there's just not much that's been written about this. And I think it's fascinating for so many different reasons. And so I'm just going to go through a couple of the reasons why. I think the New Long Affair is significant, and as I'm talking, I think some of the violent uh, aspects of this affair will um, become apparent. So first of all, I think it's just, uh, it, for me, the New Long Affair is a metaphor for thinking about empire in the 20th century. Um, for the last um, 15 years or so, I've been increasingly drawn to histories that explore empire not as a series of clearly bounded territories 
um, in communication with their respective metropoles, but as a set of contested territories that were frequently connected or disrupted by transnational or global forces of one kind or another. So I like messy stuff, things that don't conform to, to boundaries that we think of. Um, these forces can include mobile diasporas, pan movements, international communism, just to name the three that I am most interested in. Um, and it seemed to me that the new law affair and the vast network that it exposed is a concrete example of exactly this kind of porous, messy understanding of how empire functioned in the 20th century. So what we have is a network founded on an ideology and a politics with a center in Moscow and a strong relationship to the Chinese Communist Party with a central node in a semi-colonial city, Shanghai, um, with links connecting it to all the colonies in Southeast Asia. Um, from correspondence, we can see that it was not uncommon for common turn agents to move relatively quickly between places like China and Hong Kong, Indochina, Singapore, um, as was the case with Ho Chi Minh, Joseph de Clou, Bassa, and the Japanese Tom Malacca, who also comes up in this story as well. Um, so, although my focus is on <coughs> East and Southeast Asia, the worldview of the Comintern was not that limited. The New Long paper also, the papers that came with the New Long Affair, also reveal that part of the Comintern's strategy was to connect communist movements in Malaya and the Dutch East Indies with Burma and India and Siam as well. So if we were to think of it visually and overlay this network on a map of the various colonies and their contact with the, the various metropoles, it would look completely different than what empire looks like on a map. Centers would be in different places, links would be connecting all of the colonies, and individual and print culture would be moving across every boundary regardless of national orientation. Um, so to me it's appealing uh, for that reason. Oh, and here's a map to help you visualize how that might look. I mean, here's how we think of the region, but in fact, all of these lines and boundaries, they're important in terms of how you get across them, but they're not important in terms of what's actually moving um, in this period. Okay, um, and it's not just anti-colonial activists who are moving across these boundaries that look so clearly drawn on the map all of the, the colonies in Southeast Asia and the Chinese nationalist government had police intelligent networks, intel, not intelligent, intelligence networks um, to combat communist activity within their colonies. But in this period, and actually this starts earlier in the 20th century, um, in order to be effective, they had to begin to cooperate with each other. Um, one of the reasons it was difficult not to, not, one of the reasons it was difficult to be effective without cooperation is because of jurisdiction. Uh, so you couldn't just chase somebody across another boundary without um, cooperating with the relevant intelligence forces in other places. Um, so as a result, the political intelligence um, departments of the British and the French and the Dutch colonies in Southeast Asia, um, and also the British, French, and Chinese police units in China gradually developed formal mechanisms of sharing information about communist activity across colonial borders. Um, so they, they assisted each other with all kinds of vital intelligence and the new law affair is one example of where this uh, kind of cooperation occurred. Um, the Chinese, that, and in fact, one of the things that the British and the French liked about the cooperating with the Chinese nationalist forces is that they weren't as limited in terms of the use of torture. So when there was a particularly difficult case, they would give them to the nationalist uh, forces and turn them over to theirs, extract a, con uh, a confession under torture, and then they would give them back either to the French or the British. Okay. Um, so, once again, I think that the, 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 this vision of how empire function complicates these sort of national imperial, imperial borders, making them appear more fuzzy and porous than, um, than they might have seemed on paper. Okay. 
Second thing I want to talk about in terms of what I think is the significance of the new law affair is this idea of pushing back the origins of the Cold War. And actually, the book that I'm going to write on this is called The Chill Before the Cold War. Um, and I can't take credit for that. That was my husband's idea. Um, <laughs> uh, but I like it. And, um, and I think that it's really that, that the new law affair is one way into this idea that the battle between communism and anti-communism had a past that really predated the, the 1947 period when really we talk about the Cold War beginning um, by several decades. These papers really illustrate, in a relatively compact case, something that can be gleaned from a, a multitude of disparate archives uh, beginning in the early 1920s. Um, and that is that in the interwar period, the British and the French and the Dutch governments, and then later the Chinese, um, saw, saw communism as, quote, a danger of the first magnitude. There's all kinds of quotes that are like that. That's a good one. But th these are very typical ways of thinking about uh, communism in this period. This really quite paranoid preoccupation with communism as one of the principal threats to colonial stability had reached a peak in 1931 after almost a decade of growing concern following the establishment of communist parties all over the region. So you have, do I have a slide like this? Um, I thought I had a timeline, maybe not. Um, you have the, the establishment of the Indonesian Communist Party in 1920, in China in 1921, in India in 1925, in Indochina in 1930, and in Malaya in, uh, also in 1930. The establishment of communist parties appeared even more threatening in light of the communist collaboration between the United Front, what called the United Front in China. If you're not familiar with that, this was the biggest boogeyman for the French and the Dutch and the, um, and the British colonial forces at this time. In 1923, the nationalist Guomindong Party entered into an alliance with the Chinese Communist Party in order to overturn um, colonialism. That lasted until 1927. Um, there were also communist-inspired uprisings in Singapore and Indonesia in 1926 and in Indochina in 1930 and 31. Um, also, to be even more threatening, communist parties had developed in all of the metropoles of the colonial powers, and these were generally friendly, openly friendly, to communists in the colonial world. Um, also, organizations like the League Against Imperialism, which was founded in 1927, facilitated contacts between European and colonial communists. So if one were to read the colonial archives uncritically, it would appear that communists lurked around every single corner, and that international communism was a monolithic, powerful, and disciplined machine around the world. This is how it came, comes across in the archives. Um, and in addition to this colonial paranoia, after 1927, the Chinese uh, Nationalist Party became almost equally paranoid about the threat of communism to the nascent nationalist government. Now, where am I? I have a bad habit of like, losing my place in the, um, in the PowerPoint. In any case, the, the nationalist government became equally paranoid about communism after 1927, and this history is literally bathed in blood, because under Chiang Kai-shek's leadership in 1927, the united front between Chinese communists and nationalists was brought to a sudden and abrupt end with the murder of thousands of Chinese communists and a purge from the ranks of the Guomindong. So after that, Chinese communists and their allies from Russia and other places had to go completely underground in China. And Chiang made uh, communism and all other subversive materials associated with it illegal. In response, the Chinese Communist Party developed secret units for survival uh, and for penetration of Guomindong Party posts. 
not to mention posts in uh, British and French organizations as well, and this is what the New Long paper ended, papers ended up revealing later. There was also an ultra-secret group in the Chinese Communist Party that carried out assassinations of key Chinese figures who were known to have turned in communists um, or communist cells, um, or who shifted their alliances from the Communist Party and then went over to the other side. Um, one well-known instance of this was the, the communist Gu Xunzhang, who was arrested um, by nationalist police at, right before the Mulan affair happened, actually, in early 1931. When he was arrested, and he was, he was um, pretty high up in terms of these secret uh, organizations, when he was arrested, he went over to the nationalist side, and that became known by the communists, and the communists had his entire family murdered. So the stakes here was literally life and death. Um, for, for many of the people involved. So, um, unlike depictions of the Cold War after 1947 um, that explain the rift between capitalism and communism as a fundamental ideological um, division, what I think was at stake in this earlier era was not economic or social theory necessarily, but the threat that the communist internet, that communist internationalism posed for the stability of colonial rule, or in the case of the Nationalist Party, for the future of China itself. So I, I think it's not just this ideological divide that people like to talk about. Um, the very idea that colonial subjects might gain a theoretical understanding of their own oppression um, spread by activists moving in and through borders that were supposed to be firm and financed by a powerful rival was enough to make it really a very scary prospect to be beaten back at any cost. Um, so unlike movements that appear to be making demands within state or colonial borders, international communism defied national and colonial boundaries and was also very, very difficult um, to control. So instead of framing communism as somehow naturally opposite to the American way of life, which is how we sort of like to teach it in high school, at least in the United States, um, I think we need to look back at this earlier era of communist and anti-communist antagonism to understand how and why Americans were so quick to frame communism as anathema to the American way of life. And, and one of the things that people like Ann Foster argue is that they learned this. Um, the Americans learned this through their activities in the Philippines um, before 1946 because they had all this contact with the colonial governments that were so anti-communist. So, all right, so that's the second thing. Oh, I'm going backwards. You told me, you know, and I did it wrong anyway. Um, third thing, let's see how I'm doing all my time. Third thing I want to talk about was how the New Law Affair um, reveals something about the intricacies of international colonialism in East and Southeast Asia. Um, so even after all the arrests were made in June and July in, in China, in, 19, in, in Shanghai in 1931, the British summary of the case offers a gloomy prospect for the future in late 1931. It argued that even arrests on this scale were only temporary setbacks in the massive global operations that was international communism. Um, the, the archival sources on the New Law Affair uh, in British, French, and Dutch archives reproduce many confiscated documents. But they're, and actually, I mean, they, they, they reproduced everything that they found in these files. Um, when their analysts looked at them, they clearly believed that communism in East and Southeast Asia was a strong and growing movement with clear and regular direction from Moscow. What I think is interesting about the papers that they found uh, as a result of the New Law Affair is that you can juxtapose them now, later on in, in the future, um, you can juxt juxtapose that analysis um, with a later analysis, I guess, my own analysis, that I think points to a very different conclusion about what was happening with international communism at, at this time. 
Um, in fact, I would argue that communism in the region um, in 1931 was at a very low point for, um, for a variety of different reasons. The Indonesian Communist Party had been all but destroyed in the aftermath of the 1926 rebellion when the Dutch had harshly repressed the participants and all of their supporters. In China, as we know already, after four years of Chinese Communist Party collaboration with the National Kuomintang Party, Chiang Kai-shek had brutally purged the, the ranks of the Kuomintang, and now the communists were on the run and in hiding. Um, and so from that point on, communist cells were subject to extreme repression if caught by nationalist forces. In Indochina, the 1930 uprising at Yen Mei had been met with such savage violence by the French that it was known as the White Terror. Um, so there was a, a lot going on. In fact, the violence there was so prolonged that it resulted in a sharp drop in morale among Vietnamese um, communists at the time. And then in uh, April in, in 1931, the arrest and the turning of Gu Xunzhang that I was just talking about had already exposed a number of communist moles in a variety of nationalist and foreign organizations, leading to their imp uh, imprisonment or execution. Okay, so um, because of these massive disruptions in international communism, um, as we know, both the Comintern and the Chinese Communist Party had to conduct all of its activities in China in secret, and also, of course, in the colonial world, um, using legitimate businesses as covers for their covert work. Um, communications with communist parties in Indochina and Indonesia were, or the Dutch East Indies, was sporadic. And all of the regional communist parties, including the brand new Malayan and Filipino parties, were desperate for money, information, and tactics. Um, Ho Chi Minh, there's actually, when you read Ho Chi Minh's correspondence, most of the time he's going, what am I gonna tell these folks? They're asking me questions about money. Um, one of the quote is, um, every time they write me from Malaya, they ask for financial help. What concrete answer shall I give them? You know, and so you see this from, from Ho over and over again. So rather than viewing the networks involved in the, new, the Newlong case as a consolidation of power by the common term, I think it's more accurate to see the actions of, of the participants as an attempt to revive and reinvigorate connections and communications that had recently been under such serious assault. Um, so even just when the crew and Basa had been sent to Singapore, their purpose was not to, to you know, have this hegemonic um, organization be even more powerful. Their purpose was to actually reestablish connections that had been lost from the center. So there's lots of there's lots of problems happening in the in the communist um, the internationalist communist movement at this time. I probably said all that and have a couple of slides that you know. <laughs> you see, I just once I get going, I forget I forget to. To switch, but this is just giving you some of the dates that I already talked about. Um, okay, and this is the, really the last thing that I think is, is very uh, important about the New Long Affair and what it can tell us um, about international communism and, and the way that empire worked in this period. And that has to do with uh, ideas about race and gender. Um, I think it, that this affair reveals very deeply embedded ideas about both race and gender in the 20th century and how they worked, not just in terms of empire, but also in terms of communism as well. Um, no one has yet commented on any of this, except me briefly in my article that is written about this. Um, I, I think it's worth noting, for example, that when European stories told, the, uh, when European sources told the new long story, which they did often and in many, many places, the primary focus was invariably on the European men who were arrested. That is Joseph Ducroux and, of course, Hilaire Moulin, or Jacob Rodnick. Um, British sources do not even mention the fact that Ducroux had traveled to Singapore with Bassa, who was an important common term operative. Um, that nor do they bother to even note that he was arrested with two Chinese members of the Malayan Communist Party. That comes from the Dutch sources. Um, 
and, and, and one of those members had already been banished by the, the, from the colony, so it's not like they didn't know about him. Um, and, and I think that it's really is because for the, for the British, and, and I think also for the French and the Dutch uh, as well, the, the intellectual and the theoretical and the organizational driving force behind communism in the Orient, as they called it, always for them came from the Russian center, always. Um, and here's a quote. I'll let you read it for a second. Um, you can see here that it is the utter dependency of communist organizations upon Moscow and Moscow's confidential agents. So basically the idea is that these people in the East couldn't possibly have come up with these ideas on their own and must have had the, the support from Moscow and the thinking from Moscow in order to even think these things. Um, and so another quote that is not on this, uh, on this particular thing is that uh, the communist organizations in the countries of the East would die a speedy, natural death if it wasn't for um, Russian agents. Um, so for this reason, colonial governments considered Europeans always to be the most important actors here, without whom non-Europeans were incapable of maintaining a communist orientation. Um, and yet, the evidence, and yet the evidence, um, the, the evidence collected and summarized by the British themselves tell a very different story. Out of 256 names connected to the Far Eastern Bureau network, 144 of them were not European. Uh, many of them were Chinese, Japanese, Indonesian, Formosan, and also uh, Indo-Chinese. Um, so what seems to stand out in the correspondence is not so much the utter dominance of Soviet leadership, but the fact that the network would not have functioned at all without the active leadership roles of non-Europeans. But this is, again, this is not the story that the colonial archives want to tell. Um, the New Law Affair archival material also, I think, <clears throat> gives us food for thought about the ways that gender ideologies also work both within common, uh, communist networks and in the assumptions of, Western Europeans, uh, of the Western Europeans who tried to piece this all together. This is something that I'm just beginning to work on, but I think it is significant um, that one of the things, that Madame Nulon is never mentioned by name. Her first name appears nowhere in any of the, the arguments, uh, in any of the documents. That includes all of the British documents that they have in the National Archives and also the French archives as well. The Dutch sources, instead of calling her Madame or Mrs., the Dutch sources refer to her as a helpster without ever <laughs> referring to her by name. Um, so we know, though, that women were important. And in fact, Madame Yulon, Tatiana Moisenko, um, was one of the key figures. I mean, she and Jakob Rudnick were the keys in this entire network. Um, to, we also see from the payroll that there were women who were on the payroll of the Far Eastern Bureau who were getting money from the Comintern. So um, there's, I think there are some leads to follow here. Um, but the, the Western authorities show, the European authorities showed very little interest in discovering what Tatiana Moisenko might have been up to, what she might have known. She was not interrogated in the same way. All of this was about in that moment and not her. We also know from the common term sources or the sources that were recovered that female agents, though, on the other side, were not considered as important or as val well, I don't know about important, but as valuable as male agents because they were paid um, 50 gold dollars less than male agents anytime they appear on the um, payroll. So it's not just coming from the Western Europeans who are not interested in what women are doing or who think that they couldn't possibly be important, but also on the common term side, we see that female agents are not paid as much as uh, male agents. 
So while more needs to be done with this, I think that the tension between women's activity in these networks on the one hand, and either their erasure in the, confiscate, um, in the confiscated sources or their marginalization by the common term on the other, is an area that the Dulong Affair can help us with. And this is one avenue that I would like to explore in the book some more. So, in conclusion, I'll see I probably have more. Yep. Um, in conclusion, I'm really a big fan of using particular events as points of departure for emphasizing larger arguments and for exploring transnational or global interconnections. I think that the New Law Affair, in, in addition to being what I, I think it's a riveting story actually, but um, in addition to being just a great story, I think it allows us to catch a glimpse of a colonial world that is far, far messier than colonial authorities would have liked. And more specifically, it lets us delve into the very violent world of international communism and anti-communism in this period. Um, as, and this is, for me anyway, this is a subject is, that's just begging for more scholarly attention and that I hope will help us to rethink the origins of the Cold War. We do have a bit of time for questions. Do you want to take the questions? Or? Yeah. Yes. Great talk. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really interested in the last bit about um, the race and gender analysis. I think that's an amazing point to bring to this kind of Cold War, pre-Cold War discussion. Um, in terms of the labor that the women were contributing to this movement, would it have been the same kind of tasks as the men, or was it gendered labor in the sense that we see kind of women's work in other um, kind of movements? What can you say to that? I don't know yet fully, okay. but I do know that Tatiana Moisinko was doing the same kinds of things that Yakov Rodnik were, were, I mean, she was setting up all these secret addresses, she was leasing apartments, mm -hmm. she was communicating with Berlin, she, I mean, she was clearly not just a helpster. Right. She was doing, um, she was doing the, the work right. of the Far Eastern Bureau, uh, in addition to her husband. And they always call him her husband. Um, she did have a baby with her, I don't suppose they had to be married, but um, they, they, the sources, the British sources constantly, you know, like, well, if they're really married, well, if they're, you know, really together. Um, <laughs> that's the one, that is the one thing that they constantly said about her. Um, so I, there's, I just feel like there's more, I just haven't had time yet to go into some of the other women who are on the payroll and to see if I can try to track them down. Mm -hmm. Um, you can get the common term sources online. Um, you have to be able to read Russian or at least put in uh, Google Translate Russian um, <laughs> names into them. The, the, the file on Tatiana Moisenko and Jakob Rodnik is not digitized, even mm -hmm. on the Russian sources. Um, and so that means I, I need to find somebody to go get it for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's, I think there's more to, to be found. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I thought as you were highlighting the way in which this pushes back time, like the Cold War is particularly a fascinating component of this affair. Um, my question though is a little bit more concerning with colonial histories uh, as you sort of started. Is this just sort of another example from the 1930s of how borders were not as hard and fast as they seemed? Um, this is just kind of add to the stack of other colonial, you know, histories within global history, or is this somehow a new and revelatory, um, like, finding within that field in particular, as opposed to just sort of, like, communist history? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, so I think it's partially that it just adds to these stories of messy colonialism, um, and you could, you could view it that way, but I think what is so uh, interesting for me about this particular story is just the, a lot of times when we see those connections earlier on, we have very fragmentary sources, and this is just such a huge bust of everything. I mean, you don't have to do that much work to see all of the different you know, areas, and, and this isn't the British creating the sources, 
This is them taking them directly from the Far Eastern Bureau. So I think it's both like um, an example and maybe a, a particular acceleration of things going. And I think too that international communism is not just like other anti-colonial um, movements. You know, it has it has its own particular history as well. Um, it's very internationalist, and it's not just anti-colonial. It's anti-capitalist um, countries. It's you know, there's there's a lot of things going on. So I think it's both similar and special. Does that answer your question? There was a wishy-washy response. Um, my husband always says, "You guys always say it depends." Um, it's kind of <laughs> like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I'm trying to figure out what's particularly colonial about this story as opposed to um, this being a story really about the internal organization of the common term. Yeah. Because if this cache of documents um, had been found of the Latin American Europe, for example, mm -hmm. instead of the, 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 the South Asian, you would have been dealing with the same kinds of tensions between uh, Russians and other Europeans and, and, and locals, tensions over, I'm sure there's all sorts of debates about doctrine and, and, and uh, uh, you know, strategy and things that you haven't, you didn't go into in the talk, but I'm sure they must, must be there. Um, and you have the same sort of international cooperation between police to try and suss these people out and figure out who they are, and you would find the same sort of international trajectories of the militants. Uh, one of the leaders of the Latin American Bureau, you know, worked for a while uh, keeping the books of one of Henri Barbusse's uh, journals. You yeah. know, this sort of thing, the same use of the same kind of uh, anti-imperialist front organizations and, and, and so forth. So I'm guessing, I'm just trying to get at, at what is, why is this a story about colonialism? Or why can this research lead to you to something about colonialism? and not just, I found this big whack of documents from the country. Yeah, no, it's a good question, and I think part of it has to do, I mean, because you're right, it is, this is a global story that exceeds colonialism. Um, but in the case of what's happening in East and Southeast Asia, the stakes for the authorities involved are all about colonialism, because they, they feel like this is the main threat to maintaining the colonial rule. Actually, the Communist parties are pretty small compared to, you know, I mean, the, but the threat that the, and the ink and the money that the colonial um, states put in to, to, you know, like trying to suss it out and having special agents, this is, in that region, this is all a story about colonialism because for them, that's what's at stake. Also in China, it is a story about colonialism because A, um, the Chinese communists see part of their mission as getting rid of the colonialist, you know, the, the, even though it's not a formal colony, Shanghai is, I mean, it is very much uh, a semi-colonial state. Chinese activists think of it this way, and during the United Front with the Kuomintang, so did the Kuomintang, I mean, the Kuomintang is still, um, interestingly, they have a lot in common with the British and the French when they're trying to fight the communists, but their ideas were anti-colonial at, at, at the start. So it's, it's both a larger story, but in this area, it's about colonialism and its maintenance, or its overthrow. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I guess I have a question kind of related to the previous two questions. Um, how significant do you see the division between classifying your work as Cold War historiography or Cold War <laughs> history versus colonial history versus imperial history versus transnational history? Because the previous two questions both were like, is it this or this, or is it more one or the other? And I was wondering how you see those different, firstly, how those different genres might interact, and secondly, whether you think those, the way that historians divide their own work is significant or something that should be Re, uh, reconstructed. Mm -hmm. I mean, so just thinking about my own trajectory into this is I am a historian of empire and that's how I got into it. And actually this part of this story I was thinking of was going to be 
part of the same book that was part of the World War I in Southeast Asia because this is all about different anti-colonial movements. In the case of the World War I book, it was Goddard and the Vietnam Restoration Association, and then it becomes international communism. So I come at it from a very empire colonial um, perspective, but um, I can see that it is pushing up against people who sort of like state claim in terms of like the way international communism is talked about in general does not um, necessarily see the, the, the colonial story as the most important part of the story or as an important part of the story. And I don't even know yet what Cold War historians are going to say to me. Um, I think that um, one of the things I'm going to be doing with the ACLS uh, fellowship is reading a lot <laughs> in these other historiographies because I don't yet know, I mean, except for in um, Ann Foster's work, um, there aren't that many people who are trying to make the claim about earlier um, origins of the, the Cold War, particularly from the American perspective. So these are just things that I'm going to need to be working on to see how I'm going to position it. Um, clearly you are familiar with like Cold War historians, but also um, would you want to cater to the whole pan-Asianism talk going on here? Because my personal investment in this, I mean, I'm, I study the same, I study the same period, mm -hmm. but my personal investment in this is the way in which uh, communist leaders, you're right, there'll, there'll probably be just five or six, but they're like the whole British government spy network is obsessed with them, and the National Archives is just obsessed with them. But, uh, they were also uh, okay with siding with fascists, and um, as long as the British were out of the picture. And I've always struggled with that, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if that kind of like, if you're going to have to say anything about, or do you want to address that very innocent way of looking at and <coughs> like, oh, all these people, these anti-colonial people coming together, mostly just men, and it's just like, now they're coming together with, Germany or Japan. Yes, well that's what the World War One and Southeast Asia book is actually about. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's about these opportunistic <coughs> alliances with whoever yeah. is going to give you the right result. Um, with, especially with the violent anti-colonial um, activists. Because there's a variety of things happening. There's there's people who want to work constitutionally, there's, you know, um, that's why I was saying at the beginning of the talk that it was such a lofty title, there's no possible way that you could do that, even in an entire book. Um, but, but the Pan-Asianist um, aspect of it, I mean, it's a historiography that I'm familiar with from the first book. Um, I need to read more up into the 1930s. Um, I'm really comfortable with the, the um, World War I through the, the 1920s. Um, but I think that it will appear, and, and I, in no way do I want to say that, look, the communists were the good guys. They were fighting against the, you know, because there, were a, there was a lot of really bad stuff. Uh, ends justify the means kind of thing that happened on both sides. Yeah, um, but it is something to, to always keep in mind. So I have a few questions. The first is you mentioned Eamon Roy. Mm -hmm. I want to hear a bit more about how he's involved here. That's I only know because it's, uh, I came across it in the documents. I can tell you how he was involved in World War I <laughs> a lot more. I mean, because he actually appears in my <coughs> first book as well, because he moves through to Dutch East Indies um, and ends up escaping from uh, authorities. He's one of the people that makes contact with the Germans um, in the Dutch East Indies. He's everywhere. He's everywhere. He's, he's super active. Um, and the fact that Ducou had just like had this relationship with him when they were trying to import stuff into India was just something that I came across in the sources in passing. Uh, and because I know about Roy, I mentioned it. But I need to dig more. The second question is yeah, the messiness of empire. And they're talking about it's not really the neat divisions of empire that we have been made to understand. I remember a conversation I had with David on the banks of River Tenshman eating tiramisu some years ago. And 
uh, you're saying that if somebody says, I'm a 19th century historian of India, I'm a 19th century historian of Jamaica, or I'm a 20th century, I don't quite understand what that means, because you can't really separate those areas that eventually became nation states. So for me, empire has always been messy. Mm -hmm. I wonder who are you talking to, or who are you referring to, when you say that it is empire is shown as something in the three properties. What kind of scholarship are you speaking against, is what I'm curious about. Yeah, and there's actually a quote um, by Ann Foster, in fact, which is interesting, because I don't really think she writes history this way, but that the primary, um, the primary relationship in colonialism was between between colony and metropole. Um, and there is nothing in my archival research that tells me that that is the case. Mm -hmm. Nothing. And, and I mean, I just I have an article coming out in the Journal of Colonialism and Colonial History about consuls, a very unsexy topic. But in terms of the way that the consular networks, just, I mean, it, it takes information and just splatters it all over the world, and it can be used at different occasions to gather information very specifically. So, um, but I do think, like when I was when I was training as a historian of the British Empire, there is, and this is not a criticism of my committee at all. No one suggested to me, not once, that I should read a single book on the French Empire. Not a single book, um, or I mean, God forbid, the Dutch Empire. Um, you know, <laughs> did that exist? So the way that people were trained, even when I was trained, I'm 50, right? So not that long ago, but um, the the way that people were trained was to see, even even if it was like, even if people understood as they were writing history or doing archival work that they could see some of these other things. That's not how it was written about, and that is not how we were trained. So it, I just had no sense of some of the other things that were happening in, um, other, in, in other empires. Um, and when I started doing that work, you could really just see how there's no way to separate it. And I think most work in the last maybe 10 to 15 years, not, I don't know about most, but much work in the last 10 to 15 years <laughs> has been involved in trying to open that space up and just to see those connective areas because it's not like we didn't know they existed, just like with the consular network, everybody knows they were there. No one has written about them. No one has written about how they, you know, what work they did in terms of trying to make those connections. And so I think it's less of just not knowing, but not explicitly studying those connections. Yeah. Yeah. I was curious about um, your comments around unthinkability and kind of knowledge production that goes into these ideas. I was curious if in your kind of preliminary investigations, if you see people exploiting those on either side, or how that shapes strategy necessarily. Obviously, it comes up in the reporting, but you know, do does the common term know that they don't think women can really do this, or that they don't think that Asian operatives can do this the same way? I'll tell you more when I finish more of the research. <laughs> but I think, <coughs> at this point, my preliminary answer would be no. I don't think they know very much about it. I don't, I mean, I think, if, if you're looking at the, the race side of things, which I'm much more comfortable with, um, I do not think that the um, that the British, for example, were aware that their own ideas about how to think about race were fundamentally shaping the, the you know who they thought was responsible. Um, so that would be my pre preliminary answer. Is that I, I think that those were not self-consciously known. Yeah, and there's, I mean, I'm not an expert in um, um, 1920s communism um, yet, but, but the people that I know who are talk about this, these blindnesses with gender um, as well. Just thinking about, you know, just not, not quite understanding the, 
even though there is a call for gender equality, it's not working out that way in real life. Sorry, um, your comment refers to the next point of communism got me thinking. Like, this, does this, uh, obviously it pushes back the time on the Cold War. How far does it push it back? Like, if we keep extending, because in my mind, the Cold War, as you pointed out, is commonly framed as this sort of dichotomy between the US and, and Russia, or Soviet Union, and that's not what's really at play here because the US factor very little at least into this fair. Um, so then it becomes about the sort of West versus East idea or something like that. Then does it go back beyond 1931? Does it start in the 1920s or the 1920s? Like, that way, if you had to start a time of the Cold War, when does that set in if it's just about communism kind of versus um, European plus your peoples? I think it first starts to become an issue with the first Communist Party established in the colonies, which was in the Dutch East Indies in 1920. But I think it becomes a major issue for all of the colonial powers with the United Front in China in 1923. And so it's, this is certainly a factor in the, in the 20s. I thought my book was going to be about that until I found the, <laughs> the, the new law of fair sources. And I, I'm not, you know, I mean, I, I think that I will have to explain the context of the 1920s. Um, but this is definitely, I mean, the, the colonial authorities are, are worried about communism in the colonies long before. Um, and they're worried about communism more generally in Western Europe um, in the 1920s as well. Did that answer your question? Yes, I, I think I have another question, but I'll okay. just leave it there. <laughs> Thanks so much, um, really interesting um, world. Um, you have one um, bullet point where you were talking about one of the things you're interested in are these transnational kind of links and looking at things in a different way and obviously you're interested in this kind of transnational, international, communist, um, communism, but you also included pan-Islam in there, so I was a little intrigued. Normally we don't usually think of them, we think of them as usually hostile to like communism and their competitors in, in some ways, but I was reminded because um, two weeks ago we heard a really good talk uh, by Wilson Jacob at Concordia University on this new book coming out called For God or Empire about this guy Sayyid Fadl in the Indian Ocean and how much of a threat he seemed to be to the same British colonial authorities precisely because there were all kinds of rebellions and organizing, but above all that it's a transnational yep. kind of network. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts about in this period or this era, since that was really for 1890s and early turn of the century sort of perspective, what's happening with that and how does it intersect um, both in the imperial colonial imagination but also maybe on the ground between these different kinds of uh, transnational sorts of networks that are maybe operating against these yeah, I mean, I include Pan Islam because it's a big factor in my World War One and Southeast Asia book, mm -hmm. um, and I mean, it's so I feel like Pan Islam, in terms of being the bad guy, um, according to the colonial authorities, had its day yeah. um, in World War One, um, prior to World War One a little bit, but especially in World War One, and then receded at the end of the Khilafat movement. Um, so it takes a break, but but like the interesting thing about like Goddard as being a, a sort of it's it's more complicated than pan Islam, but but it does take on some of these pan Islamic ideas certainly in World War One. But then the Goddard activists um, turned to communism <laughs> after the war, and Goddard doesn't go away until I think 1945. I think. Um, Jamil Aden, I just um, read his, uh, I forgot what it's called, The Idea of Islam, something yeah, yeah. like that. He talks about how these ideas about pan-Islam, it's very threatening. Uh, anything that ha seems to cross borders, pan-Asianism also can be very threatening at, at certain times as well. Anything that seems to cross borders and have like a, um, a, a 
an ideological center. So like the the caliph or you know or Japan with uh, that brand of that I guess variety of Pan Asianism or international communism with Moscow. These these things are deeply threatening for that reason. I think um, Aiden talks about Pan Islam sort of going in cycles and after the end of the Khilafat movement, it's sort of in a low, uh, but it comes back later, after the war, after my period. In, in the 1930s, it is not as big a deal, but it is one of those things, I see continuities between how the colonial authorities respond to pan-Islam um, and the way that they end up responding to um, international communism. I guess my question again is about the borders you kind of mentioned. And mm -hmm. so you, you know, a lot of your was about empires messy. And from the sources, how messy did the imperial authorities see their own empire? Because you, I mean, it comes across that they were like flipping their shit at everything. They're like, there's communists here, there's Pan Asians there. Like, what are we going to do? I'm never going to leave my house again. Um, and like, how clean or messy did they view the British or the French or the Dutch empire? So, how porous did they see their own borders, and so like how I guess how like how solid did imperial authorities view yeah. empire? That's a great question. In fact, for Pat Manning, um, his one of his criteria of how important you can say something is is whether or not people at the time saw it at that at, in that way. Um, in my mind, what we've missed as being trained in those ways that I was talking about on the top um, by just looking at the British Empire or just looking at the French Empire, in my mind, we've missed how actually people saw it at the time, including colonial authorities, but also anti-colonial activists. Colonial authorities were never confident about the borders. They, they, taught, they knew all the time. I mean, this is one of the reasons why they had all of these agents and um, you know, passports and all this kind of stuff, because they knew this stuff was happening all the time and were constantly worried about it. So I think it's, I mean, yes, the borders existed and they, and they had jurisdiction, right? So they emphasized the hardness of the boundaries that way, but they didn't see the hardness of the boundaries actually, you know, keeping things out. Is that, I mean, it's, they see them as hard and they know they're not. Is that, yeah. I'm not saying you were going to ask. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know that this is, after kind of my comfort zone chronologically, but um, this actually reminded me of an undergrad paper I wrote many, many years ago about uh, the Greek Civil War and the kind of basically the Americans assuming that uh, Moscow is directing everything down to the kind of the uh, lowest level where in fact Moscow was like, you know, this is all you, we have nothing to do with this. And it seems like it's a recurring theme of the Americans or the colonial powers assuming way more centralization and organization than ever actually exists. Mm -hmm. so like that it really doesn't seem to be unique here. And you know, it, like, is that, is that just a general feature that everybody always assumes that the enemy has, you know, has their shit together more than they really do? Or is it specific to communism? Like, I don't know, that's kind it's of not specific to communism. I think when you see this kind of reaction is when um, a state or an entity I suppose it wouldn't have to just be a state or territory, um, feels that its security is deeply threatened. Whenever I've seen that in the, in, over the years, um, whenever you see that, then you see sort of um, disproportionate reaction by the, the state or, or organization or entity, um, only because the stakes seem to be so high. The stakes seem to be, well, if this organization um, succeeds, we'll be gone. You know, if this organization succeeds, they will overthrow us. Um, and, and this is one of the reasons I think that, that Goddard was so 
um, threatening. The, the French actually developed a special um, security agency during World War I specifically to combat the Vietnam Restoration Association, which was a small party. But um, Sao, the, the um, governor general, just thought that if they succeeded, <coughs> there would be no way of China anymore. So I think it really has to do with this, the, the level of threat um, that seems to be represented by these. Maybe like to follow on that and connecting with the question of um, how, like, I know that the British never felt that their empire was secure, right? Like it was always, there was always an awareness of how tenuous and unstable everything was. But it, it occurred to me in this context, I don't have a good handle on what British colonial administrators thought about the stability of French and Dutch colonial rule. Mm -hmm. Like, did they think that the French and the Dutch were just as unstable and precarious as they were? Or did they assume that the French and the Dutch had things more under control than they knew they did? No, they totally didn't think they had things that were more under control. And, and in fact, they didn't. <laughs> um, yeah. But the, there, there's a lot of intercolonial, like, you know, bad talking about well, the French are doing this. And the, the French, though, because of the Indian Army, often thought that the British had it more together than, uh, than vice versa. Yeah, um, but there's, no, there's certainly not a sense that the other empires, from the British perspective, had it more together. Yeah, lots of bad talking about the Dutch as well. The Dutch, again, because of the, because of the, the military forces that the British commanded, we're always um, sort of borrowing from those, <coughs> areas, um, but certainly not thinking, the British not thinking that they were better off. Maybe I'll just do something. Sorry. Sorry. Right, just really super quick factual question. Uh, you, f you have the, the, the documents that they got from the home, right? What languages were they in? What's the sort of proportions of, of how much was in French, how much was in Russian, how much was in whatever? Um, the wonderful thing about what the British did is that they translated almost everything that they got. Um, now, what I, so it's, it's in English, except that, um, and actually they, and then they sent uh, condensed versions to the Surete. They also sent a condensed version to the Americans in the Philippines and to the Dutch. Those are in English. The Dutch and the French have their own, which are in Dutch and French. Um, what I haven't, uh, what, I, what I really want to work on is um, common term um, records that I might be able to find. That uh, I don't read Russian. I could pay somebody to, to do some of that, but some of the, Apparently, this is something I just haven't had time to do yet. Apparently, some of the common term stuff that's directly relevant to this is also in German. Um, and I'm going to see what that has to say. But yeah, I mean, that was just, I mean, the reason it's so valuable is because they translated. So, but you don't know the original uh, uh, language they were in? Um, that's a good question. It might say. It might say, um, but I don't. I don't know off the top of my head if it does. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're you're totally right. Yeah. Yeah. Can following on that? So, where are the actual original documents that were seized? Are they preserved, or the only thing that's been preserved is these copies and translations? That's a great question. I don't. I have not seen the original documents. They're all the. So the the they have them in these blue files that were translated and collated, and they have them, I mean, they're boxes and boxes of them. They have them collated by region. You know, this is what's relevant for the Philippines. This is what's relevant for Indochina. Um, and then they have the central, <coughs> then they have the banking um, ones. In my experience, the, the common term documents that I have seen, a lot of them are in Russian, of course, 
but also um, German. Um, there's, I've read some in French as well. Um, but the other thing that I think is missing from this story, and I don't know how hard or easy it would be to find them, are documents from the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, because they're not, it's not the same thing. You know, I mean, there, there, there are different actors doing different things. I'm not sure how much would have been seized in the raid because this was the archive of the Far Eastern Bureau of the Common Turn, not of the Chinese Communist Party. So I think there's just more work to be done to figure out, like, is this all I can really get, or is there more? Almost out of time, I just have a quick thing. Uh, I was going to talk about language, but I was going to frame that slightly differently to ask when does it matter to know the language and when does it not when you are designing a project. But having, we had a discussion on that, but I, I was going to say that, of course, this is a fascinating story, but also the major attraction of it is the Cold War connection. But that's where you get most of your pushback. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps it's helpful to think about how this is not a story of the Cold War, how this is actually not a continuation of what becomes the Cold War later, only to dismantle those arguments to make it get stronger. Just to think about how this is separate entity than what becomes the Cold War later. Yeah, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to frame it, because it's really not the same story, but what bugs me about the way the Cold War is often told it is that it sort of like pops up in the right after world, you know, during and, and right after World War II. And what I see, just just preliminarily, I see this as like a critical backstory to how we think about the Cold War, rather than it's it's not the same story. And it and of course, people living in the 1920s and 30s had no idea what was going to come. You know, this is one of the reasons why I think it's uh, important to reevaluate the interwar period just in general, because the interwar period has often been written about as a prelude to World War II. But people living in the interwar period didn't know that that was what was going to happen. You know, so I think I see this as a backstory, but not as part of the same story. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm a articulated the question I was in the back of my head I didn't bring it up because I didn't quite know how to put it. Um, is a child born when his parents or her parents meet or when the two have sexual intercourse or when he actually delivered or she delivered, right? So there's this tendency of being very Brodelian expansive mm -hmm. uh, both in historical space and historical time. So speaking of 1930s uh, Comintern and anti-Comintern uh, operations, as fascinating as that may be in relation to Cold War is just a bit problematic to me uh, as, as a Cold War historian of a part of the world that you are covering here. Uh, that's, that's one question or comment, I guess. I don't know what it is. Um, the other one is communism as an end versus communism as a means. Um, and, and specifically in the Southeast Asian context, which I know a little bit about, um, which makes it even more problematic to speak, of, to speak of this story in the context of the Cold War, because in the middle of World War II, you see Ho Chi Minh seeking American assistance. Oh, yes. Um, and in, in immediately after World War II, you see Indonesian, one time Indonesian communists fighting each other and the fashion led by Sukarno decimating. Yep. Uh, and so, I don't know what I'm saying, but I hope you got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think, um, especially with the pushback question on the Cold War, here's one way that I would push back back, I guess. Um, and that is, even though it's not the same story, think about how critical British perspectives were for trying to influence the Americans on how they should feel about uh, communism. And that story goes back to the 1920s. So, yeah. Well, we are now out of time. Thanks. <laughs>